Sarah Ridgway and Mindy Sig, two mothers on opposite sides of the same horrific crime, came face to face when both dialed 911 on a cold snowy night of October 5th, 2012. Sarah Ridgway was first to call the police. Yeah, since nine one one, what is the address of your emergency? Yeah. Hey, what's going on there? My daughter's missing. Um, she, I guess she never made it to school this morning. How old's your daughter? She's ten. Okay, what's your daughter's name? Jessica Ridgeway. And when did you last see her? Um, this morning when she left at eight thirty. Did she walk? Yeah. And I checked her friend's house that she walked and they're not answering the door. And you said that the school called, so that you weren't? And I worked night, so I slipped through the call. Okay, sir, sorry about that. We've got several officers on the way over to um, help you out, okay? 18 days passed, and then on the 23rd of October, 2012, Mindy Sig dialed 911. Hi, this is Molly at Westminster Police. Can I help you? Hi, um, I need you to come to my house. Um, my son wants to turn himself in for the R Jessica Ridgeway murder. The confession was so outrageous that the first responder couldn't believe it. Hello. Is this Austin? Yes, it is. Hi, Austin. This is Molly at the Westminster Police Department. Hi. Can you tell me a little bit about what's going on right now or how you're feeling or, or how did this come about? Who is this Austin Sig? I, I, I don't exactly get why you're asking these questions. But before we dive into his crooked mind, let's rewind back to the 7th of October 2012, two days after 10-year-old Jessica Ridgway went missing. On October the 7th, a man was walking down the street in Superior Division in Westminster, Colorado. When lying on the sidewalk, he found an abandoned school backpack containing purple glasses, boots, urine-soaked clothes, and a water bottle with the words, Life is good. The concerned local resident noticed Jessica Ridgway's name on the water bottle and posted it online in an attempt to return the belongings. It's been over 48 hours since Jessica Ridgway went missing and there was an active Amber Alert. At least 50 police officers, including the FBI, are searching right now, overnight using bloodhounds in temperatures near freezing and still no sign of young Jessica Ridgway. The local who found the backpack wasn't aware of it and was merely trying to locate the rightful owner. We believe the backpack to be Jessica. Fortunately, someone online made the connection and alerted the police. Been looking for a lead and this possibly is that. Jessica, born on January 23rd, 2002, in Westminster, Colorado, was the daughter of Sarah Ridgway and Jeremiah Bryant. When Jessica was 10 years old, her parents were in the middle of a divorce and were entangled in a custody battle. During this time, Jessica lived with her mum, Sarah, grandmother and aunt, while her dad lived alone in Missouri. In the fifth grade at Witt Elementary School, Jessica displayed a level of independence that was a long way ahead of her age. As a member of the cheerleading squad, she often practiced at the local Stanley High School. Responsible beyond her years, Jessica took care of her dog and completed tasks without her mother asking twice. She does everything on her own because she wants to make herself look like she's a grown-up. She wants to be a teenager before she's a teenager. Jessica had plans to be a zombie lifeguard for Halloween in 2012. The irony and humour in her choice reflect the goofy and funny nature that was Jessica. Her infectious personality was complemented by her favourite colour, purple, evident in the purple rim glasses she wore daily. The last time Sarah saw Jessica was on Friday morning, October the 5th, 2012. Jessica, like any other day, was headed towards Chelsea Park to meet a friend and then walk to school. Her routine included starting the day with a granola bar and an orange accompanied by some TV while getting ready. The clock goes off and she comes down, she watches TV and she, and she eats her granola bar, goes up and gets dressed, comes down and, you know, we peel oranges for her, her snack at school. She fills up her water bottle. Earlier that morning, Jessica had made a call to her friend's dad, planning to meet at the park near his house and walk to school together. Her school was just three blocks away from her home. Sarah, having just finished a work shift, returned home at 7.30am to help her daughter in getting ready for school. Throughout the night, Jessica had been cared for by either her grandmother or aunt, as all three shared the same household. Their work schedules ensured that there was always an adult present to care for Jessica day and night. On this snowy day, Jessica left for school wearing blue jeans, a puffy black jacket with pink lining, 
and black boots with little fluffy palms. She also wore her distinctive purple prescription eyeglasses. She also carried a black and pink victorious backpack. On that particular day, Jessica walked directly to school alone because she was running late to meet up with her friend, who, along with his dad, decided to leave without her. The friend thought Jessica's mum would drive her to school. Her friend waited until just 10 minutes before school started, then asked his dad to drive him to ensure he arrived on time. A few weeks prior, there were reports of a white van attempting to lure girls with promises of candy in Colorado, putting the community on high alert. Unfortunately, on that fateful morning, Jessica was taken when she was passing a park. A gold Jeep Cherokee with a young man hiding inside, waiting to grab her. Jessica never got to school that day. Sarah, her mother, was catching up on sleep due to a late work shift the night before. Sarah awoke at 4pm, and that's when she realised Jessica had not returned home. By now, 10-year-old Jessica Ridgway was missing for eight hours. The idea that she could be eight hours in another direction put the police way behind in figuring out where this child might be. Sarah had put her phone on silent that day due to receiving several random calls, a departure from her usual practice. Upon checking her voicemails, she discovered that the school and the police had called around 10 a.m. to inform her that Jessica did not make it to school. We make the phone call to the number that the phone call to the number that the parent requests we call. Alarmed, Sarah immediately contacted the police to report Jessica missing, knowing that her daughter would never willingly miss a day of school. Hey, what's going on there? My daughter's missing. Um, I guess she never made it to school this morning. How old's your daughter? She's ten. Okay. What's your daughter's name? Jessica Bridgeway. And when did you last see her? Um, this morning when she left at 8.30. Did she walk? Yeah. And I checked her friend's house that she walked and they're not answering the door. And you said that the school called, so they weren't? And I worked nights, so I slept through the call. Okay, Sarah, sorry about that. We've got several officers on the way over to um, help you out, okay? Sarah, overcome with worry, hurried to the neighbor's house, desperately asking if they had seen Jessica. From there, she rushed to the school, scanning every inch along the route and across the campus. Despite her relentless search, Jessica was nowhere to be found. A deep sinking feeling gnawed at Sarah, torn between the possibilities of an accident or abduction. The missing posters vividly described Jessica. Blue eyes, 4 feet 10 inches tall, blonde hair and weighing 80 pounds. Jessica's reputation as a smart and safety conscious girl made it unimaginable that she would willingly enter a car with a stranger. Sarah knew Jessica was either forcefully abducted by someone unknown or perhaps willingly got into a car with someone she knew. I watch her walk out the door and I shut the door and that's the last time I saw her and I want to come walking through back through that door. Law enforcement began looking into the family exploring the possibility that someone within might be involved in Jessica's kidnapping. The first suspect was her father. I try to stay positive about it, but uh, yeah, it's all. Jeremiah was fighting for her custody, but Jessica's father was quickly ruled out as a suspect, as he had an airtight alibi in Missouri at the time of her disappearance. On that very day, he attended a court hearing regarding the custody of Jessica because he missed his child support payments. On October the 6th, the day after her disappearance, an extensive search began involving the police, family members and the public. Jessica's usual route was combed using search dogs and thermal sensors, but the efforts yielded no results. Police brought in teams of scent tracking dogs to search the family's neighbourhood. They looked in everything, you know, washers, dryers, to find this girl. Found this girl, that's the main concern. They found nothing. Finally, an Amber Alert was issued featuring Jessica's photo and description. Purple ribbons were placed around the school and along her route, serving as a visual reminder to the public of her disappearance. This bold crime sent shockwaves through the small community of 13,000 residents. Parents became more vigilant, closely monitoring their children's whereabouts and scrutinising potential suspects close to home. I think that all children should pay attention to what they're at the park near Jessica's house, there is now a growing memorial. On the 7th of October, two days after Jessica went missing, that's when the local found her backpack. Foreign DNA collected from the backpack was entered into the CODIS database. 
Turns out the DNA was matched to another case of an assault and attempted abduction earlier that year involving an adult female jogger. However, the attacker was not in the system. FBI profilers believe the suspect is likely male and might have recently missed work or suddenly the left town. He might have changed his appearance or gotten rid of his car. The discovery of Jessica's backpack raised both hope and alarm. While it suggested she might still be with her kidnapper, the fact that her glasses were missing and her clothes were soaked in urine indicated potential danger. The weekend brought a glimpse of optimism for the family when Jessica's backpack and water bottle were found in another subdivision. The police redirected their search efforts to the town of Superior to uncover leads that could bring them closer to Jessica's whereabouts. On October 10th, a tip led officers nine miles, away from Jessica's home, to the town of Arvida in Partridge Park. Human body parts were discovered in a black trash bag, deemed not intact. Police are telling us maintenance workers picking up trash along the side of this road found the body. The garbage truck is still parked here, and you can see there the crime scene markings police left behind. Today they're processing the scene and releasing the profile of a killer. New housing developments and a major freeway now surrounded Partridge Park, an old mining area. The remains, covered with a white blanket, impelled police to continue the search for more evidence in the area. Through DNA matching, the police were able to identify the torso. It was Jessica Ridgway, and her family was notified. Upon closer examination, the medical examiner observed signs of cleaning. Astonishingly, it was a wooden cross found inside her vaginal cavity was found at one of the crime scenes in the case, but police won't say which one because that is information only the killer knows. A DNA profile of a suspect was extracted from Jessica's remains. At this point, police had not ruled out Jessica's mum, Sarah. When Jessica's father, Brian, was questioned about Sarah as a potential suspect, he responded, I don't see how any parent could do something like that to their child. Just want to find my daughter. I just want her back home. In a 38-minute public statement on October 17th, Sarah expressed her understanding and cooperation with the police investigation, actively seeking to eliminate herself as a suspect. I stress that we recognize that there is a predator at large in our community. On October 17th, police canvassed the town where Mindy Sig lived. Mindy lived in the house with her two sons, Austin and his younger brother. Although the police had no immediate cause to search Mindy's home, they were questioning almost everyone. They documented the details she provided, but her neighborhood was stirring up, and the search made the residents uneasy, who found her older son, Austin Sig, odd. Also recognize that you are familiar with your neighborhood. You'll recognize when something is out of place, when something seems odd or suspicious. We ask that you call you call immediately and report that information to us. On October 19th, a tip from one of Mindy's neighbours led detectives to Austin Sig. The tip described Austin's obsession with death and a silver cross he wore around his neck. Police questioned him and searched his home, but they couldn't find sufficient evidence to press charges. They also searched his father's mansion in the town of Parker, southeast of Denver. Austin's father, a media company owner, had purchased an estate overlooking the town providing ample space for Austin to hide Jessica's remains, possessions or evidence. Potentially, police obtained a DNA sample from Austin through a buckled swab to compare with the samples they had from Jessica's water bottle and her remains. The growing police presence seemed to intensify the pressure on Austin's sick, and by October 22nd, he began to unravel, feeling sick and wobbly. He confided in his friends at Arapahoe Community College about his misery. But who was this Austin Sig, and why was he so nervous around the police? Austin Reed Sig had his roots in Westminster, Colorado, with his mother born on January 17, 1995, to Mindy and Robert. His parents parted ways when he was just a child. Post-separation, his father remarried and started living in a nearby mansion, shaping Austin's upbringing. Even after their split, Austin continued vacationing with both Mindy and Robert. His relationship with his father was cordial, though their interactions were limited during his early school years. Austin began his educational journey at Maranatha Christian Center before transferring to with elementary school. The same school Jessica went to reading and writing became a challenge during his adolescent years. Teachers observed difficulties in his concentration in class pediatricians, eventually diagnosed him with attention deficit disorder. Eddie was... He... 
he was very quiet, shy, and to himself. I would say he was gothic. He never really talked about his family or his friends. Like all he talked about was like playing or spending time with us. He always wanted to just play capture the flag. That was his main thing was to play capture the flag with us. Did he have a lot of friends? Not that I knew of, just us girls that he would hang out with all the time. Austin was attending Wayne Carl Middle School in 2008 when his mother Mindy found child pornography on Austin's computer. He was 13 years old. Austin's struggle with an anxiety disorder took center stage, with pediatricians linking it to the escalating addiction to porn. He was prescribed medication for anxiety under adult supervision. Austin's perverted interests seemed to fade into the background. Although counselors advised his father to monitor Austin's television and computer activities, there was a lack of concrete actions taken to actively track the content he consumed. This gap in supervision left Austin without the necessary support and intervention to address his challenges. Austin's father, Robert, had an extensive criminal record, which included charges such as burglary fraud, domestic violence, and driving under the influence. Although there is no evidence linking Robert to child abuse, he has a history of mistreating his spouses, leading to a restraining order from his living girlfriend. Despite the early parental conflicts, the later part of Austin's home life was characterized as loving and calm. He enjoyed a circle of friends and led a typical social life. His classmates described him as intelligent, but noted a touch of peculiarity in his demeanor. Austin was part of the Jeff College concert choir, where he found himself sometimes teased due to his high-pitched voice for his age. Beyond the choir, his interests extended to realms like World of Warcraft Call of Duty and a modest collection of decorative swords and knives. He's a smart, we never thought, like, it was shocking. He, it was, was, he was the kid that went around school and, like, the kids who walked down the hall alone, he would walk with you. However, it was his open fascination with death that marked Austin as peculiar to some of his peers. Like, he was very um, intelligent, but just those eyes, I don't know, I can't explain it. Austin's romantic journey began when he met his girlfriend at Warehouse 180, a spot for Christian teens to socialise. They started dating in late middle school and continued throughout high school without any apparent red flags describing him as a genuinely sweet guy. His girlfriend never suspected him of intending harm or malice. Throughout high school, Austin would spend the night at his girlfriend's house. Once a week, his mother Mindy noted that he would stay at her place around three nights a week, leaving the mystery of where he spent the other nights. Fellow students regarded Austin as a kind individual who would engage in friendly conversations with anyone in the hallways, offering to walk with those alone. What was he into? What kind of stuff was he computers, interested in? Um, he computers, loved computers, video games. Very smart. He liked spending time with family and his girlfriend. And sharing a room with his younger brother, Austin's side featured katanas, a kimono, and various Japanese decorations alongside an ABY Road Beatles poster. His interest in death grew, and he even considered becoming a mortician. Mindy would playfully joke about this fascination with death to friends and neighbors during his time at Stanley Lake High High School, while still a teen. Austin attended Arapo Community College taking classes that according to his brother delved into the morbid, teaching him how to commit murder and get away with it. Here's where things take a strange turn. Austin practiced zip tying, his mother claiming it was for school and crime scene investigation purposes. Mindy thought it was part of his studies, but the ACT struck her as rather unsettling. Despite early efforts to address his issues, it appears that Austin's parents became less vigilant over time. There seems to be a degree of negligence in closely monitoring Austin, even after seeking initial treatment. While it's uncertain if stricter parenting would have altered the outcome, the lack of intervention might have played a role in Austin's eventual actions. Austin's initial foray into criminal behaviour occurred on May 28, 2012, at the age of 17. In an unsettling incident, he attempted to subdue a 22-year-old female jogger near Ketna Lake in Westminster Park using a homemade chloroform rag. Austin parked his car near police surveillance. Then he roamed the park, spotting the jogger on her first lap and hid in the bushes waiting for her to circle back for another jog before attacking. Fortunately, the jogger managed to fight him off and escape, promptly reporting the incident to authorities. The jogger described him to the police as a 20 to 25 year old, five, seven inches wide male with an average build and brown hair. This vague identification profile prompted authorities to lift a DNA profile from her shirt, entering it into the FBI CODIS database, combined DNA index system. 
Following this failed attack, Austin went on a vacation to the US Virgin Islands with Mindy and Robert. While on vacation, there is no evidence to suggest he committed any crimes. Strikingly, Austin exhibited no signs of peculiar behaviour or distress after the attempted assault on the jogger leading up to the tragic incident involving Jessica Ridgway's murder. Now let's fast forward to October 22nd. The police have taken his DNA in the Jessica Ridgway case, and he knew it was only a matter of time before they would realise it was him. All along, he was nervous, and the only comfort he found was in the lap of his mother. It's unclear whether Austin frequently slept in his mom's bed, but on this particular night, he did. The night before his confession, the weight of the trauma from his actions took a toll on him, affecting him profoundly. On October 23rd, Austin finally confessed to his mom, Mindy, that he had murdered Jessica. Hi, this is Molly at Westminster Police. Can I help you? Hi, um, I need you to come to my house. Um, my son wants to turn himself in for the Jessica Ridgeway murder. And what's going on there? Now, you not hear me? He just confessed to killing her. I know. I, w I want you to tell me what's going on. Can you tell me exactly what he said? That he did it and he gave me details and her remains are in my house. Did you see them? No. Is he there with you? Yes. Is he cooperative? Yes. How old is your son? 17. What is your son's name? Austin Take. Can you spell it? You said Austin? Mm -hmm. Okay, and spell his last name for me. S is in Sam, I G G. Okay, I understand that you're probably, you know, feeling pretty crappy right now, but I want you to know that you did the right thing. Well, he, he, he did it. He just wanted me to call. He, he is turning himself in. Okay, do you think that he's going to be cooperative with the officers? Absolutely. Okay. Do you think that Austin would talk to me? Will you talk to him? Yeah, hold on. Okay. Hello? Is this Austin? Yes, it is. Hi, Austin. This is Molly at the Westminster Police Department. Hi. Can you tell me a little bit about what's going on right now or how you're feeling or, or how did this come about? I, I, I don't exactly get why you're asking these questions. I murdered Jessica Ridgeway. Okay. There is, I have proof that I did it. I, there is no other question. You just have to send a squad car something down here and right. I will answer all the questions that you want to ask okay. or anyone wants to ask of me as soon as you just, you gotta get down here. Okay. Austin, I have a police officer that's going to come over to your house, okay? Can you tell me what part of the house that her remains are in? Underneath the house and across this. Okay, did you know Jessica before this? No, I did not. Are you going to school anywhere? We're at the whole community college. And you're 17? Yes. If you have enjoyed the video, then make sure to subscribe to our channel so you won't miss out our new videos. Thanks for watching.